Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming back. Um, it's always a risk when we send people off to have coffee. Will they return? But this is proof that the, uh, the intellectual fodder that we gave you in the first half of the program was uh, sufficient not uh, to fill you up and send you on your way, but to get you stimulated for the next course. And the next course is something that I'm particularly delighted about. My name is Duncan Wood. I'm the director of the Mexico Institute. And I'm very, very happy that we are about to launch this book here today, um, which I'm sure that Eric has already talked about a little bit. But The Missing Reform, which was a project which was conceptualized here at the Wilson Center when Viridiana Rios was here as a fellow a couple of years ago. And uh, we talked about what is it that we could do to actually come up with innovative ideas for improving the rule of law in Mexico. And a lot of the focus up until that point had been, of course, on questions of violence, but we wanted to go beyond that. We wanted to talk about rule of law more broadly, extending into the spheres of corruption, into economic management, uh, and, uh, and broader society. So I'm delighted that we have with us here four of the authors uh, of this book. It's a compilation. I urge you to, uh, to get a copy if you don't have one already. It's actually a pretty good read, I have to say. And one of the nice things about this book is that in addition to the five uh, very substantive chapters, um, in the or six very substantive chapters, sorry, early on, you also have a series of shorter chapters, which was Viri's great invention, I think, here, which was to say, let's have short, snappy chapters where we present policy ideas, and hopefully these can spark debate in Mexico. Now, when we came up with this idea, the thought was that we'd push them out into the public realm and people would somehow latch onto them. But thanks to my incredibly slow reading and editing, this took a lot longer than we expected. And so we're now launching this, of course, during presidential election season in Mexico, which is fortuitous, serendipitous. There may even be some evil planning behind it. I, I'm not going to claim that at all, actually. I'm, I, I, was just, I was just lazy in the editing. Um, but I'm, I'm delighted that we're actually coming out with this book at this, this point in time. We are very fortunate to, uh, to have Viri with us here today. And uh, what I'd like to do in this panel is uh, to ask Viri to give an overall introduction to the book, and then we'll move along with David, Enrique, and Matt uh, talking about their chapters. And then we're going to come back and talk about how these ideas apply to the current questions and challenges of rule of law and security in Mexico today. Before I uh, turn the microphone over to, to Viri, I just want to uh, give a special shout out to, to Matt. He just told me that he just got tenure, which is an incredible thing. And we all know how much you have to suffer for that. So well done, Matt. Thank you. Viri, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. This is great turnout. Um, OK, so here we go. Um, I'm going to talk about the inspiration of this book and how this book came alive. Um, it's based on the idea that we failed. We failed by believing that changing the law was enough. Uh, we were pretty naive. We couldn't foresee that the problem of Mexico was much deeper, or we couldn't see. The problem of Mexico was a profound incapacity to implement the law. Five years ago, you all remember this picture, Mexico started its boldest transformation in recent history. It was a historical, powerful, multi-party coalition, uh, El Pacto por México, uh, led by then Enrique Peña Nieto, the newly elected uh, president of Mexico. Uh, and together, they managed to approve 11 structural reforms, reforms that Mexico had needed for decades. Uh, just to give you an example of this, um, back in 2011, uh, a quarter of the experts of Mexico's central bank thought that lacking these reforms was the most important reason why the Mexican economy was not growing enough. Um, 14 months, about 14 months after Peña Nieto um, took power, not a single one thought that that was an issue. Uh, the reforms targeted issues such as lack of competition in private enterprises, perverse labor incentives inside this education sector, poor development of energy infrastructure, widespread informality of labor, monopolistic structures in telecommunications, and inadequate transparency regarding spending at the state level. On paper, Peña Nieto's administration had created a new Mexico, one that all Mexicans could feel proud of. This new Mexico was a country where Pemex, the national oil company, was a productive corporation. 
partnering with billion dollar contracts with international giants to make energy cheaper and more accessible for all Mexicans. This Mexico uh, was going to be the country that was finally going to ascend from a shameful, from the always shameful um, lowest position in the OCD ranking education on education quality, uh, because public schools were, were finally going to be um, leaded and commanded by professors whose jobs were not going to be inherited, whose jobs uh, were not going to be given because they could prove to their union leaders that they had assisted to the mandatory process protest during class times. Uh, but because they were going to show for the first time that they knew, they could test that they knew the material that they were teaching. Uh, this Mexico was going to be a country where monopolies were counting their final days. And once they were gone, the price of base, the basic uh, basket of goods in Mexico would become 30% cheaper. Monopoly is in Mexico the most important driver of poverty. But the reforms failed to deliver. It was expected that Mexico was going to be growing in 2017 by 5%. Last year, we grew 2.1%. It's exactly the same amount of growth that Mexico has had in the last 18 years. In a state like, like Oaxaca and Michoacán, only 60% of the professors took the test, and only 7% approved the test with excellence. The Antitrust Commission, the one that was supposed to tackle and destroy all the monopolies of the country, remains understaffed and poorly funded. Just to give you an example of this, um, the annual budget of the Anti-Corruption Commission in Mexico of the anti um, co of the um, competition uh, antitrust sorry commission in Mexico um, is 33 million dollars. That's um, like 30, actually less. That's like 20 percent. Uh, the resources that are allocated to the U.S. Antitrust Division. So understanding what went wrong, what went wrong, um, is what this book is about. We, uh, the authors, are a group of academics, activists, and journalists that came together to tell the story of a nation whose, um, of a nation whose efforts fell short of its expectations and to explain why uh, the Mexico that we expected is yet to be. It is our argument that the approval of the structural reforms was the easiest step. Turning uh, structural reforms into reality, moving them from paper to implementation is the work that still needs to be done. To obtain tangible benefits for all Mexicans, the country needs to perform a much more complicated task, the task of creating a rule of law. It's time to stop writing then the big reforms and it's time to start fixing the small printing. Reforming is clearly and has not been enough. The most imperative pending task of Mexico is making sure that rules apply to all and to everybody in the same way, independently of income, power, and status. Without the rule of law, approved reforms are, in the best scenario, good intentions, and in the worst case, selective tools, selective weapons to use discretionarily against political enemies. It is with this certainty, with the certainty that on paper reforms won't take us any closer to the Mexico that we want, that this book came together. And that this book came uh, together with a group of experts that are uh, proposing specific and concrete recommendations to fix this and the real underlying problem of Mexico, lacking of rule of law. This book uh, will walk you over the many areas in which Mexico reforming has not been enough because informal privileges, unwritten agreements, or just blatant violations of the law without punishment have become the accepted statu quo. We explore topics from monopolistic markets to land tenure, answering questions like why Mexico's improvement in transparency have not uh, created or improved the rule of law, what civil society could do or should not do in order to promote the rule of law, and why impunity is so common in Mexico's Congress. Ours is the most holistic view of how failing to implement the law is affecting Mexico beyond only enforcement operations. And I'm gonna use my time to go over a couple of examples of the book. The book has um, 16 chapters, so I'm just gonna take three of them. 
uh, I will walk you over corruption, uh, the problem of inequality, and freedom of press. So first, uh, let's talk about the anti-corruption reforms. This is the first, this is actually the second chapter in the book. So um, Mexico has today one of the most innovative and comprehensive anti-corruption legislations of Latin America. The law is our proud. We approved it in 2015, and it is the, the successful outcome of an anti-corruption battle fought by civil society against a Congress that for decades had successfully managed to avoid to include the definition of corruption in the penal code. Our system is uh, the only one in Latin America where the Board of Citizens, a Board of Citizens, selected by citizens, is responsible for presiding and coordinating a group of federal and local institutions like the Tribunal, the General Attorney, and the General Auditor to prevent, identify, and sanction corruption, the three activities. In this system, the anti-corruption SAR is not the UN, it's not the OAS, it's a group of citizens, citizens. It's the organized Mexican civil society. What a cool thing on paper. In reality, the legislation has not been fully implemented because legislators have been systematically trying to select an anti-corruption attorney general that favors their own parties. As of now, it's been two years that we have this amazing anti-corruption law and no attorney to properly implement it. As a result, we still live in the same country that we have always lived, nada más que con leyes más bonitas. Mexico is a country where 13% of its citizens are requested a bribe or a gift whenever they try to get a free public service. In 2015, the year this, the, the, the year this legislation was approved, Mexico's federal auditor reported that $1.8 billion of Mexico's taxpayers' money was lost. What does that mean? That means that the money was not used for it was supposed to be used. If it was used in a different way, we don't know what way that was, and, or, or it was not justified, and of course, nobody has found the money yet. Today, 2018, that quantity is 60% larger. This lost money is equivalent to the annual wage of a million Mexicans. Impunity there is a rule. Out of a total of 1,400 cases where the federal auditor has reported lost money, 600 have turned, only 600 have turned into a legal sanction. That means that there is a 50% chance of just stealing the money. That's a pretty good deal for states like Veracruz that in only one year they lost a six they lost six hundred uh, million dollars. Doing it requires uh, that the law is above power, is above wealth, and is above particular interest. We need to fight inequality, and this is the second topic I'm gonna tell you about very shortly. We cannot afford that. A, we cannot afford a country, a Mexico, where the safest way to be a criminal is to have political power or to have uh, powerful friends. Rodrigo Medina, one of the ex-governors, uh, one of the 15 ex-governors uh, ex that are accused of diverting public resources, left jail a couple hours after he had been captured, just because his lawyers managed to make an effective legal defense showing that the prosecutors didn't give enough evidence of his case. Instead, we have cases like this, Sergio Sanchez, an impoverished resident of Mexico City that left prison two days ago after spending eight years without a sentence. He had been falsely accused of homicide. For all we know, there is a, uh, some evidence that Mexico City's police department have created a scheme in which fake witnesses incriminate people who lack quality legal defense. This all because the department needs to find a way to reduce its impunity statistics. We got to know about this case, the case of Sergio, because of Animal Politico, an online news outlet, I'm, I'm sure everybody here knows about it, uh, that has not only been the only or one of the few um, online places where and uh, newspapers where this note uh, got published, but also one of the most important areas where, anti where corruption cases have been uh, reported. And this takes me to my third and final point uh, that I want to talk to you, and it's also part of the book, and it's about the freedom of the press. And here again, the problem is, as in the other two topics that I was discussing before, the small print and the impunity. 
even if freedom in press, even if the freedom of the press is guaranteed in Mexico's constitution, most media outlets de facto operate as institutions that legitimize government actions. Just last year, uh, six op-ed columnists resigned from El Universal, one of the most read newspapers in Mexico, precisely because the newspapers, the newspaper showed evidence of strong conflicts of interest. The discretionary allocation of government publicity spending has created a system where most printed media depends on the government to subsist. The current administration has spent every day $1.5 million in publicity. And this is not what the Congress approved. This is 71% more. 68% of Mexican journalists, when they are asked why they are being self-censored, they don't talk about uh, violence, they actually talk about the advertisers. The absence of rule of law further discouraged serious journalism. During the present administration, 30 journalists have been assassinated in Mexico. In 2017, Mexico has become the third uh, country where more and more journalists have been assassina assassinated uh, in the world. This is above many countries that are facing actual wars. We need to change media's dependence on government resources to transform journalism into a tool that effectively monitors power and that promotes accountability. We must develop a model in which government publicity does not exist to limit rigorous or ethical journalism, but to make it flourish. Only with a free press, Mexico will manage to name and shame those who use their privilege to take advantage of their powers to further promote inequality. Only with free press, the public discussion will move into the areas that really matter and in the er not in the areas where the government want us to talk about. Um, so why don't we let's, uh, why don't we dare about, um, stop talking about Mexico needing to cut taxes like the US recently did and start talking about how to make it more competitive. Let's talk about what matters, how to eliminate the formal and informal exceptions that make the very wealthy pay fewer taxes than the middle classes. Between 2015 and 2016, the Mexican government forgave 15 big enterprises the payment of $830 million. Not a single newspaper reported this for Animal Politico. And we could keep going. Lack of rule of law is evident in Mexico's labor market, in its electoral system, in the implementation of the energy reform. All of these topics are addressed directly in the book. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna invite you uh, to read the book. As Duncan said, we have bigger chapters for good readers and then short chapters <laughs> for people that just need uh, like a very quick snap. Um, but I want to finish by saying that uh, this book collects the intelligence, commitment, and support of so many people. Um, it compromises the research, the ideas, and hopes of one of the most talented people I have ever worked with. Every single person that wrote in this book is a brave and inspiring professional who day to day, in different spheres, works to strengthen the rule of law in her or his own country. Uh, working next to them uh, to together create this book has been among the highest honors of my career. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. That was a very, very nice and uh, complete introduction. Um, and let me just say that uh, I, I'm enormously proud of the work that you put into this book, and I think it's a, it's a terrific uh, product for us to put out, and not just because it's of the, the political timing, but I think these are all important ideas to, uh, for Mexico in general, and hopefully it'll be read uh, in places beyond Mexico as well. Thank you. David. Uh, let's turn to you. Uh, your chapter focuses on the police forces. Um, so uh, I know that uh, you spend 99.9% .9 of your time thinking about this anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, this wasn't a heavy lift for you. Uh, I'm not minimizing the effort that you put in here. But, uh, you know, we were lucky enough to get uh, one of the, uh, the best experts on this particular issue. So uh, why don't you go ahead and sort of lay out your, the ideas that you present in this chapter? Sure. Uh, happy to do that. Um, uh, thank you, Duncan, for uh, having me uh, back at the Wilson Center. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, and thank everyone uh, uh, that's here. Before we proceed, I'm, do I have control of the sure, sure. Do I have command of the comm here? There we go. <laughs> um, uh, first, um, I, I want to um, uh, – this is not the same presentation I just gave, but, uh, but no problem. I want Before I, go, I move into this, I, I do want to say um, we have a, um, uh, a new 
paper that we just put out on our website uh, on the security situation in Tijuana. Uh, and Tijuana is a microcosm for many of the things that we're seeing playing out here today. I, I strongly encourage you to take a look at it, um, uh, both uh, in terms of the national rise in homicide rates uh, that we've seen over the last year. Uh, Tijuana actually this year leads the nation in homicides, um, at least numerically. Uh, there's always a contest for who has the worst rate. Uh, depending on how small your, your unit of analysis is. But uh, uh, I would strongly encourage you to take a look at it because many of the same things I'm about to talk about uh, have played out in that microcosm, uh, that particular microcosm uh, of Tijuana. Uh, but we just heard in the last panel a, a fantastic uh, discussion about um, uh, military issues, uh, in particular U.S.-Mexico uh, military cooperation, uh, security cooperation, uh, and many of the important gains that have been made. And of course, uh, there's been an enormous uh, amount of support for military involvement in uh, Mexico's domestic security situation and particularly counter-drug operations for the last uh, decade, really, actually for several decades. But in particular, in the last decade, uh, we have seen a, uh, a heavy militarization of uh, domestic law and for domestic security efforts. Uh, we saw that during the Calderon administration administration with the mass deployment of the Mexican military to multiple parts of the country. Uh, and uh, one of the things that um, was mentioned in the last panel as well uh, is the, uh, the unintended and unwanted consequences of that massive deployment, which, has in, which at that time in particular from, uh, say, uh, 2009 roughly till 2011, when we saw m most military deployments uh, and the most direct contact between the military and civilians was a dramatic dramatic increase in the number of human rights abuses uh, in uh, that period, primarily because uh, I, I think uh, the military was not really prepared for this role uh, and um, is not trained in domestic law enforcement and underscores the importance of building up a strong uh, domestic uh, uh, law enforcement apparatus. Uh, the military, I think, uh, arguably does not want to be in the position of having to deal with civilian law enforcement matters. It is there as a, uh, as a matter of last resort, as um, uh, basically a bulwark against uh, what has been seen to be unbridled uh, crime and violence in Mexico and, and a lack of civilian institutions to be able to, to, to deal with that problem. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what are some of the uh, characteristics of Mexican policing. Um, uh, in the earlier panel, it was alluded to the fact that one of the problems is there aren't enough police. That's somewhat true. Uh, arguably, um, it, having a lot of police can be a good thing. Uh, as you can see in Chile, uh, it can be maybe a bad thing, as you can see in Russia. Um, but uh, the problems I would say that Mexico has, I mean, Mexico is somewhere in the middle in Latin America in terms of numbers of police uh, per capita. It's actually higher than the number of police per capita than we have here in the United States. So I don't think it's purely a question of the number of uh, police. Uh, it's clearly, uh, as was also mentioned, uh, really a, a problem of, of uh, the quality of police. Mexico has about 400,000, sorry, 300,030 uh, 330,000 police, according to the last count uh, last year from INEHI's um, employment census. Uh, there are different estimates of, of this number uh, depending on how you count up Mexico's police agencies, but let's call it somewhere between three and 400,000 uh, police officers. That puts the number somewhere around 330 uh, uh, people per police. Uh, I can, I can, I'm going to move up front here as well. So, um, you know, you can talk about the numbers of police. Uh, I, I think uh, the more important question is, is uh, questions of quality uh, and how we deal with, with police reform in Mexico. Um, over the last, police reform is, is sort of a, a national sport um, in Mexico. Uh, there have been numerous rounds of, of police reform over the, as long as I've been alive. Um, not since 1947, but uh, basically um, there has been, there's been numerous attempts to try to uh, reform police, and a lot of that uh, effort at police reform has focused on reorganizing police, moving uh, the uh, structures of police uh, and, and trying to uh, find the right command, um, uh, locus of command, um, or the right acronym or the right name for where we put police. Um, 
In 2012, um, as was mentioned, one of the major commitments of the Peña Nieto administration um, was to address rule of law issues. There were two, uh, two items in the Pacto uh, that focused on this. Uh, one was the idea of a more coordinated, community-focused local police, Policia de Proximidad, and the other was a national uh, federal gendarmerie um, for territorial control um, to, to sort of capture ungoverned spaces. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, what's happened with, uh, with the, the, this effort. Um, but I, I think arguably the, the thing that um, perhaps draws the most attention to what are the major problems of policing during uh, the Peña Nieto administration is the September 2014 Ayotzinapa massacre, which was mentioned multiple times uh, in, in the earlier uh, discussions. And I think what the Ayotzinapa massacre underscores are uh, quite, quite well are some of the fundamental problems that we see in Mexican policing. Um, there's a general perception, I think, um, and a correct perception uh, among uh, ordinary Mexicans that police are, are not professional uh, in the way they uh, conduct themselves, that they are um, under-resourced. Um, this is an actual photo from the Tijuana Police uh, 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 Lavatory. Uh, when we were doing a, a study that I'll mention in just a moment, uh, this is this is bad. Um, sorry, whoops, hang on. Um, that police are that, that police are corrupt. Uh, that police, as in the case of uh, Iguala, um, were uh, effectively uh, infiltrated and captured by criminal elements. Um, that police are ultimately, um, for all of these reasons, ineffective at actually catching criminals. These are real life Mexican police chasing criminals that I saw on the street. Um, and um, the bottom line is that there is very little trust, public trust, in law enforcement uh, in Mexico. Uh, people, uh, the, the, the cifra negra, the, the low rate at which people report crimes in Mexico, uh, which is asked very, very high, a, a minimum of uh, three out of four crimes uh, don't get reported, largely because people have no confidence that there's any point in doing so, and actually also because they fear that going to report the crime will result in their re-victimization in some way by police. Um, so. Looking at some of the, the challenges, so one of the things that we've tried to do um, through uh, the Justice in Mexico program at the University of San Diego over the last several years is to try to m measure and monitor police effectiveness. And when we started doing this in 2009, um, we, we uh, decided to launch a series of surveys in different cities to try to basically take the pulse of police uh, organizations, police agencies uh, in different parts of the country. Um, uh, and at the time, there, there weren't police surveys uh, in Mexico. There still aren't many police surveys in Mexico, and there are very few police surveys to look at comparatively in other countries. Uh, but it's, I think, a very important uh, tool for trying to gauge what's going on inside the black box, uh, if you will, uh, as uh, Gerardo said, of the judicial sector. Um, so we conducted these surveys in 2009 in Guadalajara, in uh, 2011 in Ciudad Juarez, great year for doing security work in, Tijuana, uh, in, in Juarez, and then in 2014 in Tijuana. Um, and all told, uh, we, we surveyed about 8,000 police officers through these efforts, uh, all at the local level, uh, typically getting a response rate of about 80 percent, so highly representative, even if the 20 percent most corrupt police were not participating in the survey. Um, what we learned from that effort uh, and what we've seen in some uh, subsequent studies uh, that we learned, this is at the municipal level, is number one, police are too old, mm -hmm. right? And they're, they, um, they're the average age of police uh, in Mexico, at least at the local level, uh, is about the age at which police in the United States and other developed countries are starting to think about retirement. Um, and the reason they're so old is because uh, they can't think about retirement. Uh, because they are uh, underpaid, uh, the provisions for pensions and other uh, means to sort of move on uh, from their police careers are just not there. Uh, we had a, we, we had, uh, this was a, a surprising uh, and unfortunate finding. Another issue is that police are overwhelmingly ma uh, male. Uh, in the police uh, agencies that we looked at, uh, it was under 15 percent female. And, and that is a huge problem. Men left to their own devices are really problematic as we, we learned this year. Um, and um, it's also a problem in terms of responding to 
the half of the population uh, that they have to deal with that is not male, it leads to all kinds of uh, problems. Uh, men actually also, by the way, be, we behave better when women are around, as you can tell from this audience. Um, the, uh, the average years of education are relatively low. Um, we found that 40% had only middle school education or less in the cities we looked at. Um, and pay ranges um, in the cities we were looking at were actually relatively high compared to the national average. We also saw um, really disturbing tr tens, ten, uh, trends in terms of the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, duties uh, and, and issues that police had to deal with. Uh, we found that at least uh, six in ten wound up buying some aspect of their own uh, uniform. It's not that they weren't given uniforms, but they weren't given maybe the right size or uh, enough uh, 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 of the uniforms to last throughout the year. Enough, you know, they would get one pair of boots, but then the boots would fall apart within six months. Um, uh, we also found, um, importantly, I think very importantly, that many, uh, a majority of officers felt that the criteria for promotions were unclear and unfair, that eff effectively the, the uh, path to professional uh, advancement was an, uh, subjective and wholly dependent on your, your relationship with your superior uh, rather than your ability to do your job. Um, we also found that in um, uh, large numbers, uh, people on the force reported that there was corruption on the force and that, that the, those who said that there was corruption, seven out of ten, said that it was at the, at the very highest levels uh, in the department. Because there aren't many other surveys of police, it's really hard to know how to take that. Um, I don't have an example of a police survey in the United States that I can point to where we've asked U.S. police what percentage of your department is corrupt um, or at what levels, um, but I, I kind of think 70 is probably a high number uh, on, the, on the scale. Uh, one other organization that I know of, Causa en Común, has also done similar surveys, so we have some comparative data at the state level. Uh, they find some uh, similar trends, uh, particularly in terms of uh, not being able to get promotions um, or uh, not, know, not believing that the process is, is fair um, or feeling. Uh, one of the things that they point to that we also found uh, is that you know, six out of ten police officers are, are wind up working 24-hour, talk about Jack Bauer, Mr. Calderon, they're working the 24-hour shift. Right, which is 20, 24 por 24. You get 24 hours on, 24 hours off. Right, no bathroom breaks, just like back ba Jack Bauer. Um, that, that's, uh, th these are not humane working conditions, and they're certainly not good working conditions in which uh, we would try to get the best out of uh, law enforcement officers. Um, the other uh, 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 consistent finding is just the uh, low levels of pay. They found the average level of pay to be around 600 uh, per month, uh, $600, this is U.S. dollars per month, uh, but some states uh, like Chiapas where they're earning less than $300 a month. Um, uh, one of the things that is uh, very problematic about police uh, 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 Policing is just, the, as, as we've said, the lack of standards. They, they find um, a lack of, this is really hard to read, that's supposed to be yellow, but it's, it's chartreuse, greenish uh, in certain places. Um, th this is the only one that's supposed to be green, uh, which is Querétaro, uh, and the others are supposed to be yellow. Uh, but in any event, uh, we're talking about uh, low levels of professional standards uh, throughout most of the country. So what do we do? Uh, in my chapter, um, which is, I think, about 500 words long, um, it's very short, uh, but uh, I, I lay out some of the, the considerations, some of the things that we've learned. One is systemically, I think uh, Mexico uh, uh, has, uh, over the last uh, decade has been working to implement judicial reforms, but police have not really been brought into that process. Police are not well informed, don't feel well informed as well about uh, what their role is going to be in the new criminal justice system, uh, and uh, many people are pointing to this new criminal justice system as failing. Uh, it's not the system that's failing, it's the police and prosecutors that are supposed to be doing their job uh, in that new system uh, because they don't know how, they haven't been adequately prepared. That's not the fault of the reform, that's, uh, that's a, a problem of, of building capacity in po among police and, uh, and prosecutors. Um, one of the things that has, uh, I think, been important 
to improving policing in uh, many different parts of Mexico is the uh, allocation of block grants through uh, the FASP and Subsemun programs by which uh, states are able to apply for, uh, states and municipalities are able to apply for funding to help improve their uh, local policing. They submit a plan, uh, they get the money, uh, and then unfortunately there's no evaluation or assessment of how that worked out. But um, those kinds of block grants could be a real tool for Im improving policing. Um, Community policing needs to be a core objective, I and mean, one of the things that's happened to policing worldwide uh, for the last 50 to 100 years, uh, particularly with the advent of automobiles and, ad and air conditioning, is the distancing of police from the communities that they work in. Um, and certainly, um, that's uh, a, a, a serious problem for um, uh, Mexican policing and something that needs to be addressed. Uh, the other thing that I think is very important uh, systemically is that, um, s as Viri pointed out, uh, uh, and uh, Mary Claire, you know, citizens are really taking a more active interest and a bigger role in all aspects of reform. And one of the areas that they can really help out is through uh, citizen observatories uh, and citizen committees for public uh, security. Uh, but they, uh, for these to work, uh, they need to be adequately empowered, both through the information that they're given and through um, the uh, uh, ability to have input on uh, policy at whatever level they're working, which could be municipal, state, et cetera. Um, uh, a, a second set, uh, I would say at the department level, uh, the department level uh, as is pointed out by the data that I've presented, um, one of the problems is just needing to have merit criteria uh, and clear uh, expectations for advancement on the force. Uh, higher levels of compensation that are adequate uh, enough to uh, bring people who are highly educated uh, and competent to do their jobs. Um, I believe that the, uh, Mexico needs to increase uh, female recruitment uh, and also take steps to improve conditions for women on police forces to ensure that um, their voices are heard, that they're able to um, attend uh, to uh, the needs of uh, in particular female victims, but uh, uh, they, they can play a role uh, in, in helping uh, to move some of these reforms forward. And finally, there's, there's a real lack of adequate internal investigations and wh whistleblower protections within the force. Officers just do not feel that they can ever question or speak out when there is uh, a problem of corruption on the force and uh, that they're, uh, if they do so, they're likely to be either demoted or killed. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, David. Thank you, David. That was uh, that was fabulous. Uh, I want to move along to uh, to Enrique. Enrique, of course, has been a, a great friend to the Mexico Institute for a number of years, um, and uh, particularly on this issue of crime prevention. Uh, Enrique, why don't you take it away? Thank you so much, Duncan. I, I want to take just one minute to to say thank you to Bidi and Duncan, uh, Eric, and the rest of the team at Mexico Institute for both having me here today, uh, but also obviously for for him giving me the chance to contribute to this uh, very, very interesting document. Uh, it's, it's really an honor. It's great to, to have it uh, right next to me. Um, when Vidi, when Vidi uh, contacted me to, to write something about the intersection of the justice, the rule of law, and, and violence prevention, um, it, re it really, uh, you know, sh sh she really was putting a challenge uh, in many ways. What the, the, the most important challenge is that this conversation, this nexus between rule of law and violence prevention, had not been discussed in Mexico. The, the, the formula, the equation of improving and reforming the rule of law uh, in Mexico has never been about reducing the rates of violence. That's, that's one thing. Uh, it has been uh, a very abstract conversation. It has been, in many ways, it has been a conversation more about reforming top-down a system, that a, a, a reform that looks, that starts with a, a map of Mexico that sees the country as a whole. It doesn't uh, take into account the, 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 the different tones of gray that are really important to address uh, the problems of security that we have in Mexico. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's been a reform that for the most part has focused on improving the law, uh, tweaking the law, uh, even improving spatially uh, the courts, training judges, but has never paid attention to, uh, again, connecting these two dots. When, when, when you, uh, now I'm based in the US, and when you, when you hear about criminal justice system and you see the intersection of how uh, the tactics on the ground are really key to, re to change uh, 
uh, the, 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 the trends of crime in very particular hotspots of any given city in the US, you start seeing that connection. In, in having the US as, as a framework to understand this, this connection uh, was really interesting. My, my, my small chapter, so if, you're a, if you like long reads, don't read mine. You can use my, my, my presentation. Uh, my, 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 my chapter focuses or tries to, to put the reader uh, in, in the day after the reform was, was enabled or enacted and, and asks what is different for me as a citizen walking on the street today? What's the big difference for me as a citizen if I'm walking uh, in any given city in Mexico? And, 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 the, and the truth is that the, the difference is not big. Thank you so much. Um, so before, before I, I go back to the street level, you know, all the, the, the question that uh, really uh, put on the table for me was, was really relevant. There's a very strong correlation on the rule of law and levels of violence. Uh, this map, which is taken by the, uh, from, the, from the World Justice Project, uh, shows the level of uh, the rule of law, the strength of the rule of law in a number of countries. Uh, and you can see where, where uh, the rule of law is, 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 uh, is weak. And you can very quickly identify the, 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 the most violent countries uh, in the world. Latin America today, with only 8% of the world's population, concentrates 30% of the homicides uh, of the, in the globe. Only four countries, uh, by coincidence, the ones that are really red, uh, Mexico, Colombia, Venezuela, and Brazil, uh, with very weak rule of law, explain or, or account for 25% of all the homicides that, that take place in the world any given year. Only four countries concentrate 25% of the, all the homicides in total numbers. Uh, different rates, obviously the, the higher rates we see in smaller countries, which also have a very weak rule of law. But uh, in practical terms, there's a very, very strong correlation between the rule of law and levels of violence. This is, this is uh, the, the 2016 uh, chart for Mexico, and it shows um, I, you know, I, I recommend you to go and, and see this document, but, but it, it shows where the biggest weaknesses are. Almost in every aspect, there are areas in which the country is completely underperforming. The one that uh, is really high in this case, for example, is the absence of conflict. That means that Mexico is not, not in war, so, so th the rule of law index gives us 100% points there. That's the only one in which we have nothing uh, to work on. Um, but not only in practical terms, also in very simple theoretical terms, the equation that we have always worked with in a, when you link violence prevention or violence rates and the rule of law is that lower impunity increases the trust and the legitimacy of the state that in, in turn changes behaviors or, or makes people behave in a certain way, which helps keep improving the rule of law. This, this, this very basic cycle is completely broken and it's not connected in, in, in the Mexican uh, framework to improve the rule of law. These lines just simply do not exist. Um, it's no surprise, it's, it's not big news for I'm sure anyone here that this year was the most violent year in recent uh, history in Mexico. Uh, I think that, that the, the it's, it's, it's very interesting to see that uh, we're hitting a high uh, a year and a half after we started the, the implementation or, we, yeah, the implementation of, of the new uh, justice system. Uh, so, so, so what does that say in terms of, is, is, there, is there something that we, we can say about the narrative of some politicians saying the beginning or the establishment of the rule of law, or the new justice system is, co is correlated to, to, to violence? I think it's a, it's a question that we should, I'm not saying that's true, I just think that it's very interesting or it's very important to continue researching uh, that connection. Uh, in terms of trying to connect these two parallel policies, the status quo is, is, is the one that I just explained more or less. It, on, the justice, on the judicial reform, it's been mostly a top-down design and implementation without taking into consideration the first respondents. So because it was top-down all the money, all the time, all the effort, uh, the big conferences, all the discussions have been for judges. It's been among lawyers for the most part. 
sometimes engineers looking at the flow of the process of implementation of, 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 uh, of law uh, uh, in the country, but no trainings for police, no tra trainings for ministerios públicos. So again, if you're walking on the street in Mexico City, the first respondent, the people that you, you, you are in touch with are mostly, I mean, in terms of justice, with is police. If something happens to you, you go to ministerios públicos, and that we all know the stories, right? The, the, some, some of the stories that uh, Vidi just presented are connected to this very weak training, very weak capacity uh, at the local level. Um, it's been focused mostly on procedural, procedural aspects. Uh, in, 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 uh, I think there are interesting successes in terms of training new lawyers to understand, obviously, the, the, the implications of the new system. Uh, I'm not trying to say that the, the long-term reform has not been useful, but I'm trying to say that it has been completely, I'm sorry, it has been incomplete. Um, uh, on the violence prevention side, uh, I, I, was, I was tempted to use the Saving Mexico uh, Time magazine. <laughs> Uh, a cover, but I didn't. Uh, the, the, the administration started also uh, putting on the table that, that, they, that, that this administration would be about preventing violence, right? Uh, they created a new program uh, that was announced with, uh, you know, with, 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 all, with a very pre kind of fashion. Uh, three years later, it was completely defunded by, by the Secretaria de, de Hacienda. Now it has been reestablished. Uh, a new uh, vice ministry was, was created, uh, many of the, with, with lots of contradictions between the general law to prevent violence in Mexico and the creation of the news, this new um, uh, vice ministry. Uh, but the, the, I think the, the conclusion for me is that this was being, has been only used as, as an, a political narrative. Uh, there was a very strong need in political, ter in political terms to differentiate the current administration from the previous. Uh, and they used prevention as a great way to do it. It was also a great way to deploy resources completely uh, or, or not paying attention to what the evidence uh, showed with a very, uh, uh, very far from what data uh, establishes as priorities in the country. Uh, and the most important thing for me is that there was a lack of conceptual or programmatic connectivity between the judicial reform and the violence reduction efforts uh, in the country. So, um, just what can we do? How can we move forward? I am, I am an advocate of action. I am an advocate of, obviously, uh, you know, uh, supporting those long-term efforts, but the question is, like, what do we do today? How do we operate uh, to try to, you know, break the cycle and, and start working, working with these initiatives? Uh, in the U.S., in, in, in many years ago, when the crime was really high, uh, the Clinton administration uh, enacted the, 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 the crime bill, which has been uh, contested and questioned nowadays. I think the parameters of, of that and the implications and, and the outcomes on the consequences of that particular bill are very present in the, in the, in the discussions in the U.S., but, but, the, but violence was reduced. And I think it being, having never been uh, an explicit intention of the Mexican government to reduce violence, I think that's, that's what we need. So, so my, 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 my proposal is just one, and is to, 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 have a na to, to create a national violence reduction strategy that connects to these uh, worlds or, or these two policies, among others, for sure. But it's, it would be a national violence reduction strategy tailored, that tailors solutions for geographic and demographics with unequal access to justice. I think I'm not a lawyer, uh, I'm an architect actually. But I think it's, it's very clear and it's, it's beaut beautiful to hear this notion of justice for all. But when you walk on the streets of Mexican cities, uh, when you are from Mexico, you know very well that some populations in some places have better access to justice than others. This is true, I'm sure, everywhere in the world. Uh, the, va the concentration, violence is about uh, geographic and demographic concentration, and I think a solution that incorporates a violence prevention perspective with an angle of rule of law also needs to take, take into consideration these two factors. So how can we tailor solutions at the ground level for communities as places, but also communities as social groups that are uh, urgently requiring solutions in terms of justice? Very recently, now the, the case of um, uh, Morelia has been on the news uh, 
uh, like a very interesting effort to, to start strengthening tailored solutions for particular neighborhoods. There's, there are great examples also in the US, uh, in Spain, where community courts are established at the local level and, and help solve very targeted uh, uh, problems uh, at the ground level. The second, the second uh, aspect or characteristic of this national violence reduction strategy would be uh, a, the, the enabling of street level action. And I want to highlight the, the word action. Uh, that includes alternative sentencing and procedural justice. The evidence behind procedural justice in particular is, is really big. Uh, uh, they, they even even with, with weak, somehow weak uh, uh, rule of law, the procedure, the way the law is being enforced, the way I'm interacting direct with, uh, uh, with, with authority, with police, with ministerios públicos, can create a perception of fairness, which will help uh, uh, the, the virtue cycle that we want to create in, in one of the slides that I presented. And third, bridge a gap between justice measures with evidence-informed violence prevention efforts. Um, um, I think when, when, when David is talking about community policing and, and, and making it core uh, uh, within police institutions, he's referring to, uh, we've seen a plethora of I initiatives in Mexico creating c community policing but without really connecting those to uh, the real law enforcement activities uh, uh, that take place in, 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 on the ground. So, so it's really, really uh, baking in these preventive efforts uh, within uh, this notion of uh, uh, violence reduction and measuring this strategy against violence reduction rates, I think would be something that can be a part of a soft system, obviously. It's not the only component, but if we talk about violence reduction, there's, there's room to, to think about that, to create accountability, and also to direct resources uh, for a problem-oriented uh, approach in this regard. Um, the my last, last slide is just this notion that a justice system that works with the explicit aim of reducing violence through smart and fair policy frameworks uh, it, it would be the base for this, and that there are no, um, the prevention is an effect of a well-functioning system that incorporates the social prevention system, uh, social, uh, social policy, law enforcement, and justice. And, and, and the combination of three, three, th these three forces would produce a preventive effect in, in many behaviors that are current uh, in the country. Thank you so much. Thank you, Enrique. <clears throat> Thank you, Enrique. I think that your presentation uh, hits exactly what we're trying to do here, is to get some uh, sort of ideas out there on the table that then people can discuss. And let me emphasize that the, the purpose of this project from this point on is to socialize these ideas as much as possible in Mexico so that they're available for whoever uh, comes in uh, as the next administration and the next Congress. Matt, the justice system has been uh, discussed uh, at length so far, but uh, we'd be very interested in hearing your ideas that you've, uh, you've written down in, this, in your chapter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Eric, in the back for giving me the, the high five that you can hear me back there. And thank you, Duncan and Vidi, um, and all of you here. This is, this is a wonderful opportunity. Uh, as Enrique mentioned, uh, it's, been a, it's been a great experience to contribute to this chapter and to this effort and to be back here with the uh, Mexico Institute and the Wilson Center again. So thank you. In my chapter, which is the second chapter in section one of the book, I offer a survey or an overview of some of the obstacles or challenges facing the justice system um, and the rule of law in Mexico, uh, focusing primarily on the criminal uh, justice system and criminal procedure. Uh, with that in mind, there's, uh, as if you've been here for the, for the first panel and, and for the for the first part of this panel, you'll see that there are substantial areas of overlap. Um, hopefully, we're complementing each other in what we're saying. I think we are. Uh, but you'll see a lot of resonance with what I have to say um, with what was, has been said earlier today. That said, mine is not one of the snappy chapters. Um, so buckle down when you start reading this one. <laughs> set, apart the, uh, set aside the afternoon. Um, but I'd be happy to make uh, some snappier comments in Q&A or afterwards, so please feel free to approach me. In terms of uh, conceptual uh, 
architecture or conceptual clarification, I'd just like to say that there, there are a lot of concepts out there on the rule of law. In this particular chapter, I leverage the frameworks uh, set forth by the uh, uh, Agency for International Development for uh, USAID. Uh, but it's essentially complementary with the World Justice Project and what uh, Marie Clara Costa said earlier today and what my colleagues on this panel have said uh, just now. I will, though, say that I, imp that I structure the discussion in the chapter according to five components, order and security, legitimacy, checks and balances, fairness, and the effective application of the law in justice institutions. Within the fourth component of fairness, there's four subcomponents, equal application, procedural fairness, protection of rights and liberties, and access to justice. As you can tell, there's a lot of overlap, even if you're just thinking back to, the, to one of the images that Enrique put up just a second ago from the World Justice uh, Project. There's a lot of overlap, so we're essentially talking about the same ideas. Starting with order and security, I don't, wanna, I don't offer an in-depth discussion of crime, violence, security, or insecurity, but I, I do want to highlight some, promising, uh, some prominent um, patterns and major trends. I was going to talk about the homicide rate, but I think enough has been said of, about that. That is a major trend. Uh, it's a worrying trend. Um, even when the homicide rate was taking a slight dip in the 2014, 2015, it was looking back at, again, one of the slides from Enrique, it was on a 20 year high, <laughs> right? So even that optim uh, even though there was a temptation to think about that dip or that flattening as in an optimistic way, historically, it was still incredibly preoccupying. Uh, so it makes the increase since then that much more worrisome, especially this last year. Uh, the nature of violence is also particularly striking. Some has been said about this already. There have been some, uh, the, the, the killings are of, of a high number, but they're also grotesque and very striking, many of them. Um, I don't know that enough has been said about mass graves. Uh, the, the, the rising number of mass graves is incredibly striking. And then uh, I just wanted to emphasize massacres as well. Um, a lot has been said about the Ayotzinapa massacre but it's not alone, right? We're, we're talking about dozens of massacres uh, in recent years. There's very little data on other kinds of high impact violent crimes, extortion, kidnapping, but the data that we do have is very preoccupying as well. Analysts speak of kidnapping explosions, extortion explosions, so we have that on the table as well. Further, it's not just uh, ordinary people or vulnerable people that are targeted by this violence, people in prominent positions uh, of power, very visible positions of power are also targeted, uh, police, soldiers, politicians, and journalists. So that fact is also worrisome. Within this context of order and security, I'd like to, to, to slow down a little bit and talk about some of the victimization data that, that is a little bit more detailed and it offers a little bit more information uh, about some of the, the, the recent patterns and trends. Victimization has been rising since the mid 2000s. So these are surveys by different sources, including the America's Barometer uh, surveys that um, uh, Rebecca Bill Chavez mentioned earlier today but also the Mexican government's own victimization surveys. From about one in five to one in 10 uh, people reporting, reporting being victimized, again, whether they go to authorities or not, right, but they, they're reported that they report being victimized in these anonymous surveys, it, that number has risen to about one, to one in three to one in four people in the last two to three years. In 2016, one third, one to one quarter of people have been victim of a crime. So one in three people, say in this room, one, one in three to one in four people have been victims of a crime in the previous 12 months. There are strong reasons to think that these are conservative estimates. These are largely individuals reporting this. These are not households. So if you think about the sense of insecurity being framed by not just your own experience, but the experience of your loved ones, relatives, friends, et cetera, uh, these individual statistics are, are an, a conservative estimate of household insecurity. Also, a lot of these numbers report only single instances of victimization. They're not reporting multiple instances of victimization over the course of previous 12 months. So we have every reason to think that those rates are higher. Um, indeed, um, 
the most recent data from America's barometer from last year reports that 25% of people have been victims of a crime two or more times in the preceding 12 years. Now we start to speak of the concentration of crime. I'm updating a little bit the material that's in the chapter, but the concentration of crime that Enrique was talking about, right? If you look at the data even further, uh, about 5% of the population has been a victim of a crime five or more times in the previous 12 months. You might be tempted to think that that's a small number, that's a small percentage of the population, right? 5% of, of people. But that's an incredible concentration of repeated victimization. 5% of the population is suffering from, uh, from a crime every two to three months. Right? Again, we're not talking about household figures, we're talking about individual figures. Uh, Enrique sort of set the stage also by talking about geographic distributions. Uh, these are all national figures, so if we start to unpack these and look closely at some states, um, uh, Estado de Mexico and Mexico City are some of the most uh, preoccupying locations. In, in the state of Mexico, the most populous state in the country, one in two people report being a victim of a crime in the preceding 12 months. Uh, there's a table in the chapter that I would draw your attention to that, that, that uh, identifies the states in which that have reported rates higher than 30% in any of the last six years. Along with these objective experiences of crime, <laughs> actual experiences of victimization, we could think about subjective perceptions of insecurity, and we have a lot of data on that as well, and, and those are also high and worrisome. Um, uh, re again, Rebecca Bill Chavez mentioned some of the America's barometer data uh, referring to the insecurity among in Mexico's uh, northern border region. But I would like to emphasize that this insecurity is also especially concentrated among women. One third, more than a third of women feel unsafe in their homes, at school, and at work. And more than 80% of women feel unsafe on the street. In Tamaulipas, uh, one, of the, one of the cases that drew my attention, due to fear and insecurity, more than 50%, more than half of women reported stopping, that they stopped going out to eat. More than 60% stopped using taxis, going for walks, going out to theater or movies, or going out to visit friends or family. And more than 75%, more than three quarters of women, stopped going out at night entirely. Mm -hmm. So at least one out of every three women has stopped routine activities and social interactions outside of the house, and most people associate with, you know, that most of us would associate with a normal, sort of ordinarily daily life. Uh, setting stark boundaries in their lives and increasing their social isolation. Uh, I'm reading a little bit from the chapter just because I want to emphasize this. And one in eight women abound, abandon their education right, due to insecurity, hindering their long-term potential for uh, economic uh, and other kinds of growth. I would echo Enrique's uh, call for a more preventive, proactive mindset with regards to, to crime. There's a tendency to favor short-term reactive policies. And in my own, from my own perspective, even when there, are, when, when, uh, when there is uh, a spotlight on so-called preventive policing, which often basically boils down to police driving around trying to intercede or interrupt a crime that might be in progress, right? That's not truly a preventive mindset, right? When we're talking about identifying the root sources of crime and criminality and, a try, to, and try to address those very early on, uh, and largely those end up being structural demographic um, sources, at least that's what the research tells us. So again, I would say that a major challenge, which Enrique identified in his own talk, is to develop truly uh, proactive, preventive policies and implement them. Uh, turning to legitimacy, uh, again, Enrique laid the, laid the, set the stage nicely, talking about the link between impunity, right, all of this insecurity, uh, and trust and confidence in, in institutions. I would also add sort of the sense of, of these institutions as being normatively appropriate. Again, we have lots of polling data from America's Barometer and from the Mexican government itself showing declining trust and confidence. Um, <coughs> very few people, echoing uh, David Shirk's comments, very few people report a crime when they're actually victimized. Most people that 
uh, do not report their victimization, talk about the fact that doing so would be useless, maybe even dangerous or risky to themselves. So we have the sense of the justice institutions themselves being perceived as inept, incompetent, or even dangerous. Right? Uh, one of the most worrisome things to me has come from um, my own work with, with David Shirk. Uh, we've, we've worked on, 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 a, on one of those justice barometer surveys to, together, and even legal elites report some of the same patterns, right? So in a, in a survey of judges and prosecutors, um, David can correct me, I think it was the 2011 survey, but judges and prosecutors report these same behaviors and attitudes <laughs> ab about the uselessness, incompetence, or perhaps even dangerousness of reporting crimes that they themselves, right, as legal experts, have experienced. Turning to checks and balances, uh, I would say there are some major advances under the uh, criminal procedure reform that came together finally in, in 2016, and, but is still being implemented. Um, separations, for instance, separations of certain functions between judges and prosecutors, even separating out different stages of criminal procedure according to different types of judging, right? Sort of the pre-trial motions versus the trial versus sentencing phases. These have all been separated out, which create some nice uh, checks and balances. Uh, however, alongside some of the comments that have already been made about uh, training and education, public defenders have, all, have largely been left out of this process. And that has m two major consequences. One, the rights of the accused have le are left highly vulnerable. And two, a uh, core counterweight in the justice system is left out of the picture. Uh, turning to fairness, there's a lot that I could say about equal protection, procedural fairness, protection of human rights, or access to justice. Um, some of my own work has drawn attention to the geographic un unevenness of the performance of various justice institutions. Uh, but I would also say that the justice institution tends to ensnare the poor and marginalized. These are points that Elena Saola and Marcelo Bergman have, have made in their own work. Um, in 2013, 80% of all inmates in Mexico City and the state of, of Mexico were in custody for theft or property crimes. And most of these crimes were for very small amounts of money. Right? And so one of those examples was, was up on a slide earlier on this panel. We could, uh, with regards to procedural fairness, we could talk about the Ayotzinapa case as a kind of crucial case of, the f of, a, of a, an absence of procedural fairness. Uh, enough has been said about the Ayotzinapa case today, but I would say that there were some reasons to expect that, that at least here there would be some more attention to procedural matters, in part due to the high visibility, the international visibility of, of the case, including this group of interdisciplinary experts that was brought on to oversee the case, and in part because it was coming at the end, or towards the end, right in the last two years of this new reform to the criminal justice system. And yet, aside from secrecy, obstruction, lack of access to key witnesses, uh, the disappearance of key witnesses, like a videotape from one of the court evidence rooms, uh, mishandling of evidence. Um, the, this group of interdisciplinary experts also found that the statements of key witnesses had been obtained after, but, uh, with the use of, of torture and violence and were therefore unreliable or inadmissible. Again, some of the worst violations of procedural fairness in one of the cases where we would expect, oh, at least here, <laughs> right? Perhaps we have some good signs that, the, that, that we might see positive evidence. In another one of the findings from the America's Barometer, um, there is a really worrisome absence of the public's confidence in the courts to be able to deliver a fair trial. So from 2004 to 2006, about a third of the public expressed little trust in this procedural, core procedural right. This rose to about 37% in 2008, 41% in 2010 to 2012, and then jumped to 50%, right? Half of the general public does not have confidence in the court's ability to deliver a fair trial. Again, coming at the end of this reform process right, that has received so much attention. With regards to the protection of human rights, 
uh, the data is also similarly worrisome, right? General public increasingly perceive basic rights as vulnerable and unprotected. There is a very, not, not only are the levels bad, but the trend is worrisome as well, right? Um, uh, early on, about 10 years ago, a quarter of the population thought that these that the that that fundamental human rights were not protected. This rose to a third, rose to a half, and the data from last year report fifty six percent of the general population do not think that basic human rights are protected in Mexican society. This rises to seventy five percent. Three quarters of the general population have a lukewarm, right? On a scale of one to seven, they respond four or lower about whether basic human rights are protected in Mexico, 75%. So only 25% of the population is giving any kind of positive response to that question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting the sense that I should speed up here. How many minutes do I have? I'm just depressed, that's all. I, I, I just, I have to say, it's, I think it's, we, 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 you know, it's, uh, please, go, please go on, complete the presentation. It's just, right. it's, it's awfully sad, isn't it? I was going to say something. It, it is. I agree. It, um, um, I was going to say something about press freedom, but I think also freedom of exp and freedom of expression. But I think Vidiana covered that um, in her introduction to this panel. Uh, with regards to access to justice, um, inmates in Mexico City and the state of Mexico increasingly report that they simply do not understand why they are where they are. Mm -hmm. So uh, that the last figure that we have available is again 80% of inmates do not understand why they are where they are. Um, and most of these cases again are for property crimes and most of those cases are for property crimes involving a small amount of property. Right? Uh, lastly, with regards to effective application, I think some of this has been covered by my colleagues on this panel already. Um, I, would, I would draw attention to maybe two ways in which, in which we might think about the, whether the justice institutions are able to apply the laws uh, effectively. One is in their ability to simply contain violence, right? not even to reduce violence, but to contain violence, and I don't think the evidence is very good in that regard. The other is simply to their ability to function effectively, competently on a day-to-day -day basis in administering justice. Uh, here, under this uh, uh, section on, on ordinary, everyday administration of justice, I would point to two challenges. Uh, one is the weak structure of careers, and, and David Shirk I, uh, spoke about this with regards to police and prosecutors, but especially with regards to police. Uh, and, in, and in surveys of police, this evidence, com this, this challenge comes across very clearly. Again, thinking about what David Shirk said, I tend to think of, uh, and, and other analysts tend to think of the police as the tip of the spear or the edge of the knife of the state. I, I'm not quite sure what to think about that metaphor of spears or knives in terms of the state. But if we think of the police as the most familiar face of the state, as David Shirk was suggesting, and, and, and I think as Enrique was also suggesting, then this very familiar face is is not very well equipped to to come across well, right? Not just to leave a good first impression, but then to to come back and have uh, repeated positive interactions. The other challenge is institutional instability, and here I don't need to say anything beyond what David Shirk said in pointing out that police reform appears to be some kind of national sport in Mexico. Right, the very frequency of, of, of reform generates instability as the actors are trying to adapt time and time again to change. So here I would say that what we need is perhaps, again, longer horizons, a more strategic vision, and a real commitment to the results of, of, of the design that is adapted. Uh, ironically, it was just in this discussion in December of 2017 when the internal security law was, was approved that, that, that on the table was also a, 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 a reform to more fully professionalize the police. Mm -hmm. And that reform was discarded in favor of the internal security law. Right? That was a particularly poignant moment. If it wasn't on the same day, it was very close. <laughs> where this, 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 uh, this uh, in initiative, this impulse to professionalize the civilian police was set aside in favor of the internal security law. 
so that was a, an, an ironic, uh, poignant, and disappointing moment. So on that note, I think I will stop and say thank you, and I look <laughs> forward to questions and answers. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> so I'm sitting here, and I'm, I'm listening to all the presentations, uh, and uh, the thought just, it's inescapable that 10 years ago, if we'd had a panel talking about these issues, many of the things that we would have said would have been exactly the same. And beyond just a facile plus a change, I think that this is one of the things that makes us begin to question. I mean, you've talked about the need for more money, the need for procedural, uh, structural change, the question of public confidence. It's always occurred to me that there's, there's no shortage of good ideas in Mexico, as evidenced by the authors in this book. It's always, um, as, as Viri said earlier on, there's no, there's no shortage of actually good laws in Mexico. Um, and we've done the diagnostic over and over again. And without wishing to stretch the comparison at all, when you look at where success has been achieved in Mexico in different areas, and, you know, I'm a firm believer that something like the energy reform was a successful reform. We had the diagnostic for years beforehand, and the problem got worse and worse and worse and worse. And eventually, somebody came along and said, you know what, we've actually got to do something about this. And it was a question of political will that actually moved it forward. It was political will and getting together the political coalition. Is there any way that you four any of you could see that kind of conjuncture of political will um, and political cooperation, collaboration coming together at any point in the near future. I'll let you mull on that while I take questions from the audience. I'd like to take three questions, if I may. There are 15 questions out there. Who do I choose? My favorites, of course. There's a lady up at the back there in a pink uh, sweater. I can't see your, your face is in shadow, yes. June Beidel with the Congressional Research Service. This is for David or whoever wants to answer it. Looking for glimmers. What about the uh, Nicaragua example in terms of policing, or perhaps we could call it an anomaly? Um, my understanding from very light reading on this is um, there's something of a machista critique going on because of the presence of women on the force. Um, and sort of really doing community policing somehow. So just, just to look for a glimmer of why don't they have the same kind of homicide, crime, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, let's take a question over from this side of the room. I have one down here, in you go. And then the next question will be down here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, David has painted us a, a picture of uh, the Mexican police, which is, uh, like Duncan said, uh, takes us just to a very, very dark place. Uh, and I can really back it up because 15 years ago, I was chief of analysis for the Querétaro State Police. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sad to see that the statistics have not moved, mm -hmm. uh, only slightly. So here we are and we're at the crossroads mm -hmm. and we have the military, really, which have been doing public security or internal security for the past 52 years, which are the highest rated institution performing public security. Mm -hmm. The trust level is up at 84 to 86%. And they are setting up, or at the very early stages of setting up a military police force, which is really, will be really not different from what the Colombian National Police looks like, or what the Chilean Carabiner Carabineros or the Italian Carabinieri. They have a fully professional meritocratic system in place. So what are the arguments against it? Thank you, and question right here. Yes, uh, I address my question to Mr. Bettencourt. Could you introduce yourself, please? Yes, my name is Professor Goldberg. I live and work in Italy, <coughs> but I have lived 10 years in Colombia, in Cali, Colombia, during the narco violence. And I would suspect that the chart for kidnapping follows your chart for homicides. When I lived in Colombia, kidnapping was a growth industry and was quick to get results because people purposely avoided the police. Mm 
and talking about police, I think you really need professionals when you deal with kidnappers. What are your, your statistics show? Thank you very much. Um, just a, a very, very brief comment on my part about the uh, uh, David's point about more women police officers. Um, one of the many times that I was asked for a bribe in Mexico City was one night I was driving home and I was pulled over by the police and uh, there were two police officers in the car, a man and a woman. It was the man who came over to me and requested the bribe, basically. And when I refused to pay it and you know, he said, well, you have to come down to the delegacion with us. And I said, yeah, that's fine. He said, well, you don't want to go down to the delegacion. It's dangerous down there. And I said, uh, <laughs> but you're going to be there. He says, I know. And... <laughs> And, and I, he didn't, you know, didn't quite understand why. I gave him my driver's license, and, and we turned around. We went back down the hill. And about a kilometer later, the car stopped. It was the woman who got out of the car and gave me back my driver's license, saying, you know what, you can go home. I, I'm not going to waste our time with, with you. The point of this is, is that, let's face it, you know, humans are humans. And they're, they're, the tendency of women to be corrupt may be less than men, but you're not going to eliminate the problem just by having that. And it always struck me as, as interesting in Mexico City when it was women who could give you a, a traffic ticket and men weren't allowed to. Mm -hmm. It didn't eliminate the problem either. I mean, th things may have got better. And so, you know, just my own personal experience with this, and it's anecdotal entirely, of course, but it's like, you know, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a strange little extra dimension. Mm -hmm. Okay, Viri, why don't you kick off the responses? Thank you. Um, I'd like to address the point of political will. And, and I also like to address the point of uh, Professor... Uh, yeah, Colbert. Um, so if we look at the graph of homicides and we compare it to the graph of kidnapping, they actually have completely different trends. Kidnapped stopped in a close to 2011. And from there, we saw an, an important diminish in kidnapping. And right now, we are probably having the less amount of kidnappings that we have seen in the last 10 years. And the difference, well, we have both the statistics going down. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's a fact. Like organizations that study from civil society kidnapping have shown that it has gone down. And the reason why it has happened is because in Mexico there is a big difference uh, on the political will of authorities to fight the crimes that are affecting the middle class and the upper classes than to fight the, cla the, the crimes that are affecting the rest of the people. And this goes back to the core of the argument of this book, which is that in Mexico, the law exists, except it doesn't exist for everybody, or it doesn't exist for everybody with the same strength. There is a reason why violence went down in Nuevo León, and it was because most of the important businessmen and business group of the country exist in Nuevo León. And they managed to, A, convince the government, but also fund themselves by taxing themselves in private ways to create a better police. The same thing is not going to happen in Guerrero, it's not going to happen in Michoacán, it's not going to happen in Oaxaca, in places that are less politically, uh, less politically alive precisely because um, a different type of Mexican exists. So we have these two, two, two tiers of, of enforcement. Um, so um, in terms of political will, and to finish because we don't have a lot of time, um, the problem is exactly the same. Uh, the problem is that um, we live in a country where implementing the law is not necessarily a, <laughs> a requirement. Therefore, the law is, 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 is implemented uh, discretionarily. The reason why anti-corruption measures are emerging right now is because it has the two conditions that are going to make political will um, actually um, you know, take the next step. One is a civil society that is organized and requesting this, a civil society that is also the middle class and the upper class, by the way. And second, uh, press, the freedom of the press, which is a topic that both Andrew and I discuss in our presentations. Thank you. David. So uh, I'll also very briefly talk about political will. I mean, in theory, in, in a democracy, political will is achieved when votes matter, mm -hmm. voters are informed, voters feel empowered, uh, uh, and voters are active or actively uh, agitated uh, by something. Um, I, votes, votes don't matter, I don't think, as much as they should uh, to politicians in Mexico. Uh, at least they haven't for the last s 100 years uh, because um, 
there's, there's no consequence when you're not able to be reelected. So we're about to see maybe a change in the next few years mm -hmm. as voters uh, matter more. Um, it's difficult for voters to be informed if they're under, uh, if, if the press is under siege. Uh, uh, but on, on the flip side, we've seen a democratization of information through technology, uh, uh, YouTube, et cetera, and, and the only thing that could um, uh, complicate that would be for uh, the things that you see on your smartphone or on Facebook to be falsified by a Russian bot, um, which is something I think we have to worry about in the upcoming election. Um, the uh, a sense of empowerment, I think, very much depends on whether or not voters have an education, a job, and, and, and things like that, which Mexico's made some progress on. Um, but in the absence of these things, I mean, what will drive, what will motivate politicians are the constituents that maybe uh, actually matter, and that might be the business community. Mm -hmm. uh, it might be um, uh, powerful uh, forces um, that um, unfortunately uh, are illicit businesses. And, and, and I think um, we're hopefully seeing a shift in Mexico towards the theory of the way democracy works as opposed to that the reality. Um, on Nicaragua, I'm not an expert on, on Nicaragua, June, so I'd love to talk to you more about uh, what you're seeing there. But I mean, lower crime rates are also partly a function of just, I mean, Nicaragua's problems, I think, are very different from Mexico's <laughs> problems right now. Um, and um, on the question of why not the military, uh, if it has the uh, the highest public approval ratings, uh, uh, Inigo's question. I mean, I, I alluded to it in my presentation. Um, the military is not really equipped to deal with civilian populations, uh, and as a result, we often tend to see higher rates of uh, uh, human rights abuses uh, as a result of the military's insertion. Arguably, you could train the military to have that role, uh, but I think uh, a, a democratic police force is a desirable alternative to that. Um, the question of, uh, so I just want to say something about kidnapping following um, homicides. You know, in the study we just did in Tijuana, what's really interesting is homicides have gone way up, but other indicators of crime have not. Uh, and it's not purely a measurement uh, or reporting error. Uh, I actually think that there are just different trends that we're seeing with the violence that we're seeing today in Mexico compared to, say, five uh, or ten years ago. Um, that. I don't have time to get to in the last few seconds, but I do want to say something about women. Um, I, I do think that um, there is there is something different about the way that women comport themselves than men, uh, um, in the sense that 90% or more of violent actors in any society around the world mm -hmm. have one thing in common: they're men. A, a Y chromosome, <laughs> right? And at le or at least the ones that get caught, right? Because they're the ones that go to jail. But I, I think that um, I think that there is something about gender and violence, gender and crime, that we need to pay attention to. Um, and I, I do think that it also affects the way that institutions work. It's why we should have more women everywhere, uh, at, at all levels. And you know, look at this table. Um, we have, uh, a, I think, a real need to balance out. I think gender plays in to the to these issues uh, in ways that are. Uh, subtle but important. Okay. Generally speaking, I think that the, uh, really, really, really addressed well, m m particularly the question about homicide. But I can, I can give you an example. Uh, I was part of an effort in 2010 to reduce violence in Ciudad Juarez uh, when I was working for, for the federal government. And what brought us there was the homicide rate. So the reason why we, uh, we arrived to Juarez was the homicide rate. Um, when we arrived to Juarez, as federal agents, the first interaction we had was obviously with those uh, who are the, 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 the powerful in the city. So, you know, maybe the president of the local university, the mayor, obviously, the representative of, of the state, but mostly the business community. And uh, they were the ones who were mostly affected by kidnapping. The first decision was, that was made uh, above my paycheck was to create an anti-kidnapping special prosecutor. Uh, kidnap because that was the demand. So, so we, you came here because of the homicides, but we're not worried about the homicides. Mm -hmm. We're worried about the kidnapping. So you solve that problem and then we can discuss other issues. 
the, the, the special prosecution prosecutor was established. Homicide uh, kidnapping rates went down to zero very quickly. So when the state decides that they want to tackle one complex issue can be achieved, I think that's something that we can say. I mean, the worst uh, crisis of kidnapping in Mexico is Ciudad Juarez. To zero, like, in, in, in months. Then, after, only after that, then, okay, they were like, Let's, we can start discussing homicides. <laughs> so I think at the center of this uh, conversation, there's this, this notion of uh, social justice. Yeah. We're discussing issues, issues of social justice. Um, I don't, I don't believe in political will. Uh, I believe in political interest. I have dealt, I, have, I know politi politicians. There's not such a thing as political will. I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a way we, could, we refer to something that is called political interest. And unless we bring accountability to politicians to reduce homicide rates for those who are being killed, notwithstanding the social status, I don't think that this, uh, this, this uh, convergence of political will and uh, uh, an effort to really address these issues today will, will, will happen. Matt. Yeah, just, um, I guess I'd, I'd also like to address the question about uh, political will, adding a layer to what Enrique just said. There's, there's an enormous <laughs> literature in, in my home discipline of political science about what exactly political will um, is right. I, I've I confess that I've I find that the phrase rather empty and unsatisfying, and I, I I don't really know political will when I see it. Like what it, what it, what am I looking for? When when is it absent? When is it there? Um, so in social scientists tend to think of will or that kind of political commitment in terms of uh, material and non-material components. We could think of ideas or interests, right? And uh, Maria Clara Costa, when asked sort of uh, what works, right? What has worked? And you were mentioning the example of El Corral. Um, you mentioned a few things that were interesting, I mean, interesting to me, right? Leadership, courage. <laughs> you could think of those things as maybe some non-material ideational components, right? These, they're ideas that might inhabit inside somebody's head that might, might give them the motivation to do something about a problem, right? We might call that will. Uh, but we could, we could be a little bit more specific, right? Where they might be educational issues, background issues, maybe even ideology. These are all sort of uh, ideas that might motivate somebody to do something about a particular problem, but then we get into the material components, right? Interest incentives that might motivate, really push somebody to do something, even though they might not really sincerely want to. <laughs> and, and again, with, there's, a, there's a large literature on this, right? That some, a very dominant argument is that the good thing about competitive elections is that they create material incentives to do the right thing, right? If you want to keep your office, then you need to provide some sound public policies out there. So in that regard, we want competitive elections. But that's only because they generate material interests, right, that push people to do something that, if left to their own devices, they would not choose to do on their own. Uh, so that's just all in, 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 uh, in terms of fleshing out this idea of political will. Um, I'd love to be a part of a larger conversation about exactly what it is and how we know it when we see it. Um, on, on kidnapping and homicide, I, I really defer to Vidi because this is, this is her area, except that my one, my one uh, nagging hesitation is that we have so little data on extortion and kidnappings. At least the best victimization survey data tells us that only one to 2% of kidnappings are reported. And so that's a major known unknown, right? I know I don't know very much about kidnappings, right? And so uh, I guess I'm hesitant to, to, to plant a flag in the ground about that. Um, and then lastly, I just echo some of the comments by, by David, right, with regards to Inigo's question. As I, I think there's a wide range of normative and practical reasons to prefer constitutional democratic policing not just about the various investigative, pr prosecutorial, adjudicatory roles that, that um, civilian institutions play versus military ones, but if I think just about some of the core lessons about community policing and what that means, and if we think about military institutions involved in those functions, then we're talking about community militarization in some way, 
I'm not. Ex it's not. A it's not exactly clear what a community military police looks like, or whether it's normatively desirable in a constitutional democracy. Military is a fantastic institution. Uh, it has a lot of respect in Mexico, and I would hate to see that be eroded because it's asked to do things that maybe it shouldn't be doing. Matt, all of our panelists, thank you very, very much for being here. For our panelists who were here earlier on today, again, thank you so much for supporting us. Um, to you, the audience, uh, I hope that when we hold our annual security and rule of law review next year, that we actually are able to uh, say that some of the ideas that are included in this book have been embraced by somebody somewhere along the chain of command. Um, and I also hope that uh, perhaps at some point we're able to report better news on uh, violence, security, crime in Mexico than we have today. Um, thank you very much for being here. Please take the time to read the book, both the long and the short chapters. Um, and uh, please continue to watch this space here at the Mexico Institute. Thank you. Thank you.